Take heart, my friend. We'll go together this uncertain road that lies ahead. John chapter 2, and we're going to cover verses 12 to the end of the chapter. If you will remember the previous paragraph, Jesus had come and he turned water into wine. And we make the easy connection that wine is the source of, of joy uh, in a marriage, in a wedding especially. I mean, obviously, it's not a matter of abusing and so forth, but wine was used uh, and it still is to liven one, make it more lively. Um, and Jesus turned water into wine and he turned a lot of water into wine. And it was the absolute best wine one could ever taste. Uh, the bringing of joy. But you know, in any situation, to bring joy, one needs to have certain characteristics, order, and purity. My kids, uh, Desiree and David, are getting ready to do a party this Friday for, for young people. And they have to get the house ready and get games ready and have everything just so. Why? Because the more order and, and the more prepared they are, then the better the party is going to be. Right? In a marriage. You want a good marriage? Guess what? There needs to be purity. There needs to be uh, integrity and purity so that you can have a great marriage. Or anybody can have a good marriage. And when there isn't, then there, is, there are problems. Uh, in a home, the family, not just the marriage, the father and mother, but the children. Some children bring darkness into the home, and what happens? There's chaos and problems, right? Within siblings, even when after siblings, they all start getting married off, right? And if there hasn't been purity and so forth, there's problems. So, yes, Jesus is the one that brings purity, uh, brings joy, but it's through purity. And what we're going to find here is that Jesus Christ is absolutely concerned about purity to lead the way to joy. John, the gospel writer, has been showing that Jesus Christ is God himself, but also he is man. And this greatest of miracles that God himself became a man, to, and he came to earth, and he grew up, and he died, rose again from the dead. And it's a very, very hard thing to uh, believe that God himself was walking around here as a man on earth. Uh, but that's what, exactly what he did. And so John, the gospel writer, is, 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 is working at that to help people believe that this is what actually happened. That Jesus is actually the promised Messiah that God promised ages back. He really is the Messiah, but he's not only the Messiah, he's also the Son of God, meaning he is equal to God the Father, all right? So he set out to be, and so we begin in chapter 2, where he turned water into wine. But now he's going to show that, that, that zeal for purity, for the name of God, the character of God. And that's what we all need if we're going to experience joy and experience what God wants for us or for our children or for whatever. We need to help and work on this whole issue of purity and being morally uh, upright before the Lord. And so where, where does Jesus start? When he came and he started public ministry, he goes to the center of worship, to the foundation place of the whole religion, the temple. Right. Now, Jesus had been growing in popularity. And this is what really what you, we see in verse 12 and verse 23. Uh, he had been successful in ministry. Right? Um, but then he shows what is to be utmost for the name of God. Oswald Chambers, uh, my utmost for his highest. My utmost effort to represent the highest, my ut utmost for his highest. And here Jesus shows his utmost for God's highest, for the name of his Father, the name of God. That's verses 13 through 17. And then there's the need to respond. 
to have uh, faith and spiritual insight. Verse 18, verse 18 through 22. Um, but then being very careful that we do not depend on, me, on mere human flesh, on mere humans. And we're going to see this in this passage. Okay? So, Jesus demonstrates that we are to be first and foremost concerned about God's name. Jesus demonstrates that we are to be first and foremost concerned about God's name and not put our hopes in people's responses to us. Did you get that? Because we're, we're so caught up for that. Or how are people going to respond to me? And so we're concerned about people rather than the name of God, the character of God. And Jesus shows us the way. So first of all, then the success. Verse 12 and verse 23. Um, after this, that is after he had just turned the water into wine and uh, disciples had believed, verse uh, 11. Now in verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Now, <laughs> take note. Uh, many, many times, the majority of the times, our immediate siblings or parents or children are the last individuals that respond to us sharing the gospel. Many, many times that's the way it is. But here we find that Jesus' brothers, at least initially, were following him. And his mother, of course. So there was that sense of like, wow, even your brothers are following you? Yeah, initially. You see, but there was, there was success. Uh, he goes down to Capernaum. Eventually, Capernaum becomes the, uh, the home base for Jesus for a while. But anyway, he was there. Now look at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. So there was that initial trust, initial belief because of what Jesus was doing. He was being successful, right? He really was being successful. Uh, and again, the signs, as we said, signs, uh, someone said it is a physical, we see something that happens, but it only to, points to something that we cannot see. A sign is something that we can see, but that points to something that we cannot see. Jesus was performing all these miracles, and the miracle itself wasn't the point, but it was pointing to his character, his, his, his deity, that normally we cannot see. But he was performing these this, this signs, and the, the, turning the water to wine was the first one that John the Gospel writer presents. So, but he was having success. Him and his brothers uh, were following him, and in verse 23, the Passover was there, and he was having a great success during that time. Now, note again, verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, the Passover, again, very, very important to understand. The Passover, many of us know, was the time where there was a celebration and a commemoration of what God had done, right, when he was taking the, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. Uh, he had, you know, uh, catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe to the Egyptians because the Pharaoh would not let uh, go of God's people. Finally, the firstborn of every Egyptian from every human being to every animal died. The firstborn died. But God said, look, you need to take the blood of a lamb, put it on your do doorpost and your lintel, and when the angel of death goes by, passes over where he sees the blood, no one will be harmed. They were saved by the blood, by the blood of the lamb, right? And so this was God's great, great work, and it was be to be commemorated every year. It was a national holiday. Uh, it was one of three times during the year that every male, every Israelite was to go up to Jerusalem and to celebrate the Passover, to remember what? Remember what? Remember the character of God and remember the power of God to save. You see, that was the Passover. But the Passover had become a mere tradition 
The Passover had come like Christmas had come, has come to be in our days. What is, what is Christmas now? It's all commercialized. It's all money. It's all money. And so it is with the things of God that it happens over and over and over. And the Passover had turned out kind of like that. Right? So Jesus says, I've come to bring salvation. I've come to bring joy. Uh, not just to the nation, but every person in our lives. He comes to the, that he can bring us salvation and joy. But what has to happen first? What has to happen is that there needs to be a purity. There needs to be a, a, a moral uprightness. A relating with God in a righteous, moral way. And so what does he do? He goes to the temple. Now we pick it up in verse 14. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and dove and the money changers seated at their tables. Uh, the temple there, the word is used for the whole uh, campus, so to speak. Uh, there was a place where... The Gentiles could go, but they could go only to a certain limit within the temple precinct. They could no longer go further into the tem uh, temple proper to, to worship. And in that temple uh, part where the Gentiles could go, that's where the money changers were. So this whole temple thing was supposed to be representing God and attracting people from all over the world. And now it had become a place to, of business to make money. So you had animals and you had people, the money changers. The money changers were kind of like the, uh, what we have here on the border between Texas and Mexico. You have places where you go and if you want to buy pesos, right, you give... A hundred dollars and they give you a bunch of pesos back. Well, in that exchange, those money changers make money. And then when you come back, you want to change the pesos back to dollars, you can buy the dollars again, only it's going to cost you more. So they make money. And that's what you had here in the temple area where the Gentiles were supposed to be coming. They were making money. Off of the time when they were supposed to be remembering God's character and helping people worship. And that sent Jesus. He, he got mad. Right? Because if there's going to be joy, if there's going to be purity, if there's going to be salvation, there needs to be this purity, this righteousness. And he is the king. Right? And so, what does he do? Verse 15. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all uh, out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Oh my goodness. Cleaning house. Cleaning house. And why does he, did he do that? Look at what it says. Uh, verse 16. Uh... And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Oh, can we go into that today? No? How much the church has become a business. Big celebrity speakers selling their books. All kinds of Things to make money and they promote and they promote and they promote. Uh, some authors pay thousands and thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, so that their book will be successful. It's a money making thing. Stop making the house of my father a place of business. Oh, if there's going to be purity and joy, we have to go through this cleansing. And the disciples remembered. 
There is what's written. Note carefully. The disciples remembered. That it was written. Zeal for your house will consume me. It's straight out of uh, Psalm 69. And I want you to turn to Psalm 69. Because... As I've said before, anytime the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's a good idea to go back to the Old Testament, to that passage, and see the context. Because you get to understand more and more what's going on. So, uh, Psm 69 is what's, uh, what's called a lament psalm. And uh, the disciples remember a certain passage. Um, psalm 69 is, no, let's start in verse... 9, because it, well, let's turn to verse 5. Psalm 69, verse 5. And I want you to note how the concentration, listen to this. As we read this passage here in Psalm 69, starting in verse 5 and following, I want you to know the concentration uh, on the person of God and the concern for the name of God, for God's reputation. I want you to know that. And that's what was burning the psalmist. Right? Even as he lamented his situation, that it was very bad, the psalmist was concerned for the character of God, the name of God, the kingdom of God. So verse 5, O oh God, it is you who knows my folly and my wrongs are not hidden from you. May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me, O Lord God of hosts. May those who seek you not be dishonored through me, O God of Israel. Verse 7. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Dishonor has come, has covered my face. I have uh, become estranged from my brothers and an alien to my mother's sons. The zeal of your house. Here's what the disciples remember. The zeal of your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept in my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate talk about me, and I am the song of the drunkards. This last part here, it reminds me last night we, we went to the mayor's uh, prayer luncheon. Uh, Del Tackett was the speaker. He was the main teacher in the, the Truth Project. And one of the things that they put up on the screen that he quoted, I can't remember from who, who he was quoted, quoting, but it was something like this. The more truth is rejected, then the more those who speak the truth will be hated. Isn't that amazing? The more truth is left behind and rejected, then those who speak the truth will be hated all the more. Here in this passage, he says, I become a byword. Those that go to the gate and those that went to the gate uh, there are the judges, the uh, lawyers, like the, court, like the courthouse. And back then, when you entered a city, the, at the gates, that's where the judges and lawyers and those that did business, that's where they met. And so when he says those that go to the gate, uh, verse 12, those who sit in the gate talk about me, and I am the song of drunkards. Why? Because he had this zeal for the things of God. And so when Jesus, back in John 2, when Jesus goes and, you know, runs everybody out, turns the money table, uh, money, and throws the money changers out, he had the zeal that the disciples remembered. The disciples remembered way after. This was years and years later. And we were like, man, when Jesus did that back then, that's what was happening. They remembered Psalm 69. You see? But it was the, the name, the character of God. 
And this was the, the Passover, the national holiday of God delivering the Egyptians. And then this was at the temple, the center of worship. So Jesus went to the root of the problem, right? And he, and he showed his zeal for the things of God. So we have here then, uh, Jesus says, look, uh, I'm having success, but what is most important? I need to give my utmost for his highest. I need to live for the name of my father. And my name of my father is purity and holiness. And I'm going to have a zeal for that. And that needs to happen in our own lives, in our own personal lives. That we wrestle through and say, what am I giving into that's not of the Lord? Lord, give me the grace because I want to represent you well. Oh, Jesus, of course, did it perfectly, perfectly. But now from that, we have the various responses, no? Some people respond to that with uh, unbelief, uh, rejection, uh, callousness. Uh, they're afraid that they're going to lose power. Uh, there's no humility. Uh, I, I still want to do my own thing. Uh, okay, 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 I'll go to church, but the rest of the week is mine. <laughs> Ay, we are something else, aren't we? No, no. We need to completely submit to the Lord in all areas. In all areas. Not just Sunday morning. All the time, all areas, everywhere. And so, how, am I, how are we going to respond? I don't, I don't want to let go of control. I don't want somebody else to tell me what to do. You see? God says, well, you have it my way or have it your way. One of the two. And guess what's going to happen if you have it your way? Not good. And so some people respond with, no, I will not. Others will respond with belief and curiosity and Lord help. Oh, wow, God, look what you're doing. And they believe. And we have these two responses here. First, the callous, the non-believing response. And that's of the leaders, the Jewish leaders, because what? They were going to lose control. The people were flocking to Jesus. Right? Our church is getting empty. <laughs> and Jesus is the cause. Get him. Nail him. And so now that's what they're, they're going to do. In verse 18, the Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Imagine that. Imagine that. Here are these puny, little, power-hungry fools questioning the Lord of the universe. But there's the blindness, no? The blindness. And we are there so many times. Why, God? Why? Would you? And we argue with it. Puny little us. And you know, I'm going to do my thing, Lord. Hi. What sign do you show us? Goodness. Uh, verse 19. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. In essence, no matter what I say, you're not going to believe. So let me throw something at you uh, that's going to baffle you, and you're going to go off in some direction, but you're not believing anyway. And that's the thing, no, of belief. It's not so much whether we rationally, logically get it. It's the point of the heart trusting, like a child having faith. You know. Oh, no. What sign? Jesus says, well, destroy this temple. In three days, I will raise it up. Uh, verse 21. Uh, verse uh, 20, sorry. The Jews then said, it took 40 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And the word you there is in a very, what's called an emphatic position, meaning... It took 40 years. And of all people, you are going to raise it in three days? Yeah, right. That's the point. It's a put down. 
a callous response, an unbelief response. And the scriptures are full of such responses of people who refuse to believe and with childlike faith receive, believe. So that was the, the one respond. Now here's a different response, verse 21. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Notice scripture is singular, not plural. Probably pointing to a specific passage. Most likely is Psalm 16. It doesn't quote it like this, but that's interesting, that's singular there. But the disciples remembered and they believed. They looked back, maybe 10, 20, 30 years back. Maybe more. John, the gospel writer, wrote decades later. And then he says, when he had been raised from the dead, they remembered, they went back like, oh, that's what he was talking about. They responded by faith. By faith. You see. And it's very instructive for us as we go into our time of application of what we will see here. But they remembered and they believed the word of Jesus. He spoke in this. Now, Jesus knew better. Jesus knew better when there's a, an initial faith, an initial reaction to the things of the Lord. It's great. It's great. But Jesus knew better. Um, so now we read in uh, verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. He knew better. Um, at some point later, uh, even his own relatives thought he'd lost his mind. Yeah. Mother, brothers, man, he's gone crazy. He's lost it. Look, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, uh, again, towards the beginning of, of, of ministry, Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 21, says this, well, start with verse 20, and he came home, and the crowds gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. For they were saying, he has lost his senses. He's gone nuts. <laughs> Jesus knew. In John chapter 7, his own brothers started mocking Jesus. Hey, it's the Passover again. <laughs> Jesus. Why don't you go to the Passover? You're this great guy. Go do some miracles. Yep. So even though there was an initial success, Jesus knew what was in man. We're fickle. We change our minds. We, we start going very strong, and all of a sudden, by the time we know it, forget it. And here we go. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. And you and I need to realize that there is a growing trust that we're to be having in one another as we grow in the Lord. But ultimately, 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 it's the Lord God. It's Jesus. Whether it's our parents, our siblings, our spouse, there is to need to be a growing trust that we grow, right? But ultimately, it is Jesus, it is God alone that we put our trust in. So, here we have then Jesus demonstrating that, listen, uh, there needs to be a purity. There needs to be this zeal for the character of God. 
uh, that's the first and foremost for his, for his name, for his kingdom. Everything else is secondary. My career, even my own family, the character of God, the name of God. So let me look then at a couple of applications and then we'll get into our time of uh, questions uh, and, and discussion. But first of all, we need to put our trust in the Bible. And we need to have confidence in the Bible. It is a trustworthy. Uh, and that trustworthiness is based on Christ's own trust of the scriptures. And Christ's own uh, 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 demonstration of who he is. He predicted his death and his resurrection. And it happened. Destroy this temple and you will. And in three days I will raise it up. And he did. And he did. And Jesus trusts in the scriptures. And he, he, he validated what he said. So for us to put our trust in the scriptures, it's a solid trust. The Bible you have in your hands, nowadays in your phone, <laughs> is trustworthy. It's trustworthy. What did the disciples say? The disciples realized, right? Man, that's what he said. He told the Jews, destroy this temple in three days. I'm going to raise it up. The disciples remembered and they believed Jesus' word. And what does it say in verse 22 again? They believe the scripture and the word which Jesus has spoken. You see that? And these days more and more. People are doubting, rejecting the Bible as the word of God. Oh, it's just a, a man-made. And over the years, it's been changed, of course. Look at anything that's been, they don't realize it. We go back to the original. We have plenty of copies that we point don't have us to, to go the through original. decades and decades and hundreds and thousands of years. And now we have what we have. No. But it's based on Christ's own prediction and trustworthiness. So the Bible is completely trustworthy because Jesus who rose again from the dead verified it. Then, so trust the Bible. Uh, then secondly, I want you to turn to Jeremiah uh, 17 and this is one of those foundational passages in my own uh, understanding uh, of, you know, the relationship between God and us humans and uh, with each other. Uh, Jeremiah 17, starting in verse 5. Uh, thus says the Lord. This is not thus says Reuben. Thus says the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. There's three steps there. Three things, right? Who trusts in mankind... And who makes flesh his strength, and logically, consequently, his heart turns away from the Lord. What does that mean? Who trusts in mankind. Mankind has what I need for my soul and for survival, for what I need to fulfill. Mankind has it. Curse is the man who trusts in mankind. And, what's the second one? Makes flesh his strength. I have the whereabouts to get it from mankind, what I need. Mankind has what my soul needs, and I have the whereabouts. I have the uh, knowledge. I have the physical. I have the emotional, rational, volitional power to get from them what I need. Cursed is the man who does that. And logically whose heart turns away from the Lord. Ultimate trust is in the Lord and not mere humanity and especially ourselves. What are the consequences when that happens? 
What are the consequences when that happens? Look at the next verse. Verse 6. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony waste in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitants. Amazing to me when I travel to other countries and see the poverty and the suffering of people. And we come over here back home and we live in palaces. Air conditioned. And we bellyache. And we complain. And we rage against God. Why am I living like this? This is not right. It's not right. Not good. Do you really care for me, God? We get spoiled. We get spoiled. We will not see when prosperity comes. And that's the consequence. Jesus saw, right? People were believing and he did not entrust himself to man because he knew what was in man. Ultimately, our trust needs to be in the Lord. Then, really what I think this passage back in John chapter 2 is calling us to, obviously to look, look, look to Jesus, look to Jesus for our example, to be, have a, a zeal for the name of the Lord, for the things of God, for the kingdom of God, uh, but a call to purity, a call to live in the way that honors God. Uh, but it can get to the point that we do not know that. We do not sense that because we become callous and we become uh, uh, numb you know, to, to, to the real need for, for purity. In Jeremiah chapter 6, Jeremiah chapter 6, another one of those passages that has helped me over and over and over over the years uh, understand humanity and, and, and what's going on in our times. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 13 through 15. For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. For they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they have done? They were not even ashamed. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. The Jews, when Jesus threw out the money changers and all the animals, and what did they do? Did they break down and repent? Hey, what authority do you have to do these things? What sign do you show? <laughs> they were not even ashamed that Jesus had exposed them. Isn't that an amazing thing? They had gotten so callous, so used to the business. It's just business as usual. And not caring really for the name and character of God. Um, they were arrogant, questioning the Savior. What sign do you show? My goodness. We need to be careful that we do not use the church merely to escape realities of sin. Right? They deal with the wounds of my people, with the problems, superficially, saying peace, peace, and there is no peace. Just as long as you come to church and give your check, thank you very much, we'll put on a good show for you. Dealing with the woundedness of my people superficially. No, we must not use the church just to escape the realities of sin and the effects of sin. Whether the sin is our own personal sin or the sins of others. Falsehood and denial are not to be tolerated in the church for the sake of the glory of God. For the sake of the kingdom of God. Not because I'm just going to feel better. 
I'm going to feel better if I don't smoke, if I don't cuss, if I don't steal. I'm going to feel better. No, that's not good enough reason. It's for the glory, the zeal of the house of the Lord. You see? Uh, we need to be very, very clear on that. Because we can become very moralistic, do's and don'ts. Just because, ah, I can nail you, ah, I can nail you. <laughs> like a, you know, Doc Holiday. <laughs> I can get you. <laughs> No, no. It needs to be for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Jesus demonstrated. Jesus demonstrated very, very clearly that we are to first and foremost be concerned about God's name and not put our hopes in people's responses to us. My friend, we'll go together this uncertain road that lies ahead Our faithful God has always gone before us And He will lead the way once again